And now without uh, any further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce our, our keynote speaker. We're very honored to have Dr. Latoya Miles as our keynote speaker today. Dr. Miles is the acting director of the NOAA Air Resources Laboratories Atmospheric Turbulence and Diffusion Division. It's located in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. She's a Mississippi native and graduate of Elkhorn State University with a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry and a Bachelor of Science in Biology, and a graduate of Florida A&M University with a PhD in Environmental Sciences. She is a member of the NOAA Center for Coastal and Marine Ecosystem Science Advisory Council and the NEON Interagency Working Group. She also serves as the chair of the AGU Honors and Recognition Committee. As an environmental scientist, she has incorporated NADP data into her research of nitrogen at the intersection of air and ecosystems. And we're very glad to have you speak to us today, Dr. Miles. Thanks so much, Greg. I will share my screen. Greetings, everyone. I want to extend a very, very heartfelt thank you to Greg and the entire NADP Planning Committee for inviting me to give the keynote address today. I'm very honored by the invitation. Um, and I also wanna ask Greg if he'd do me a, a favor when my time is coming to an end and I have perhaps five to six minutes left, if you just pop in and give me a verbal uh, time check, that'd be perfect. Sure. Awesome. Thank you. So as has been mentioned by the previous speakers, the theme of this symposium is NADP in a changing world. And when Greg first contacted me and we started exchanging messages about delivering this keynote address today, uh, the world and what I thought about uh, what a changing world meant was very different on February 18th than it is here at the end of October 2020. And I don't think Greg nor I nor any of us participating today had any idea of just how much change we would all experience over the last few months. Uh, change on a global scale has been absolutely unprecedented this year. And I'd like to share some of my thoughts about atmospheric research in light of the changes we've seen and also in thinking about some of the changes we may be experiencing uh, in the next year or two or five or 10. And then I'll also in the last half of this presentation to talk a little bit about some of the work that's ongoing with some of my ARL colleagues, uh, particularly those in the office where I'm now serving as acting director, which is ATDD uh, in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. So when we talk about change, can we just honestly say that change is hard but it's been even harder in 2020. I think, again, we've been in such an unprecedented time where even the items that we thought were immutable have changed on a dime this year. And as global citizens, we really had to think about the change and how that has affected us professionally as well as personally, altering how and when and even where we go to work and how we conduct our science, how we collect our samples, how we engineer our sites, just every aspect of the scientific enterprise has been touched by the global pandemic this year. Uh, and while there are innumerable ways that we could think about this, when I started making notes about what I wanted to share today, I thought about three large bins that I could kind of place this change into. One was a changing environment. The next is a changing community and then also changing technology. And I think this quote that's attributed to Darwin really speaks to the fact that we've all had to be nimble and flexible and quite frankly, very patient <laughs> as scientists and engineers and policymakers and, and um, stakeholders this year. Uh, it, but we've continued to bring that patience and that nimbleness forward as we are advancing our science to the greatest extent possible. So being adaptable will not only help us survive, but also help us thrive. So under the category of changing environment, I'll start with hurricanes. And I think mainly because I live in the Southeastern United States, work in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, 
and southeastern United States is going to be affected by Hurricane Zeta over the next few hours. And Zeta is our 27th named storm this year. And when we think about Zeta, we think about the cumulative impact of hurricanes. This is just an image showing some of the hurricane tracks going back many, many years on both the Pacific and the Atlantic. But an average hurricane season produces 12 named storms. Six of those are considered to be hurricanes. Three of those six will be major. Well, 2020 has been extremely active to say the least. And we still have a month to go before hurricane season ends. And as we think about the impact of hurricanes on the atmospheric environment uh, that we study, that impact can't be underestimated. We have to consider the frequency and the severity of all of these storms in planning of where we locate our sites, how we conduct our process studies, uh, what types of instrumentation we're deploying at these sites. Are they rugged? Is it able to withstand uh, what could be multiple feet of precipitation or high velocity winds at any given time? And so this aerial image is actually damaged in Lake Charles, Louisiana, after Hurricane Delta, which occurred in August. Uh, and this photo is from the NOAA's National Geodetic Survey. And just the aerial imagery of the damage that we saw after this hurricane, the extent of damage to this community, as well as to any type of infrastructure that may have been on the ground here is just absolutely phenomenal. And so when I think about how our atmospheric research progresses, we still have to have the ability to have stations and sites and operators and hosts for those sites that are able to help us co continue to keep networks like NADP and others going in spite of major storms such as this. You know, the next is severe storms and, and severe storms take many forms. And they've been widespread and destructive. And when you think about the straight line winds that hit central Iowa back in August, I think you know, we will all agree that this storm uh, really fits that definition of severe. And in thinking about the highest official wind gusts that happened, uh, officially they were 99 miles per hour, but the unofficial was 106 miles per hour of winds that happened in this particular storm. But you know, here's a photo of some grain bins and the damage that came from this derecho. So the human, the environmental, the economic toll of this type of severe storm and weather event was very, very high. Uh, over $7.5 billion of damage by NOAA's estimate right now, which makes this storm the fourth most expensive storm that the US has experienced since 1980. And on a, a side note, when we talk in terms of communication and engaging with the public, I think that term derecho has gone out of meteorological textbooks in undergraduate and graduate classes and is now into the lexicon of the general public, particularly in this area that was damaged by this storm. So again, this is a changing world, changing terminology, more interest in the science from the public that we serve. And of course, being with NOAA, I couldn't talk about a changing environment if I didn't talk a little bit about coastal, coastal flooding and inundation. It's been a major concern. Here's a coastal inundation dashboard developed by NOAA that's looking at over 200 water level stations. And they've been merged into this online tool that individuals can use in order to monitor and prepare for flooding events in their various communities. Uh, this is from NOAA's co-ops program that runs this dashboard. And then here's a photo from Charleston, South Carolina during a high tide event that was not even connected to a storm. This was a storm free day, but still a high tide event that's flooding this community. And the pace of tidal flooding we know from the data is accelerating not only in Charleston, but in coastal cities around the country and even around the world. And we need scientific information in order to be able to address phenomena like this so that we can inform mitigation strategies so that we can help local folks on the ground be able to plan for events like this. And then of course land cover. So when we think about land cover, 
This is an image from NOAA's Land Cover Atlas. It's a free online tool again, where you can zoom in on coastal counties. And you can see here, uh, this is Miami-Dade County and how land cover is changing over time in this particular area. So in this tool, we have 29 states that are fronting the oceans as well as the Great Lakes that are included here where you can look at them. And some analysis shown between 1996 and 2011, there were nearly 65,000 square miles of coastal region that experienced land cover change. Talk about dramatic widespread spatial change, uh, including declines in wetlands and deforestation. Uh, and what's the major contributing factor to that? Of course, it's development, it's the built environment. So overall, when we think about that, 8.2% of our coastal regions on the oceans and the Great Lakes has experienced some of these changes. Uh, there's a five year period in the early 2000s that accounted for 43% of all land cover change across the entire continental United States. And so when we think about taking measurements and being able to make environmental predictions, these are some of the changing variable conditions that we have to contend with, with both our observations as well as our modeling activities. And then of course, wildfires. You know, as the Southwestern United States has dealt with heat waves over the past few months, state of California was experiencing wildfires. They saw intense lightning strikes, which produced some 11,000 cloud to ground lightning strikes that are shown here uh, and highlighted aboard uh, from this satellite imagery. And one thing I want to highlight though is it's very interesting how this issue was really shown as a West Coast problem. However, that all changed when we had haze happening in Washington, D.C. and other cities on the East Coast. That got the attention and the public took notice. And so one of the things I have said frequently when I make presentations is the atmosphere doesn't respect state nor country boundaries. Uh, we are all affected by the events that happen and the emissions that occur in other states and other countries. It, it's become sort of a common. And we all need to be concerned when we have major events like wildfires that occur in different parts of the country and different parts of the world that can affect the air quality that we see in our own communities. And I'd be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about the global pandemic. <laughs> uh, it has changed so much as I and others have mentioned this morning, uh, but there's also a growing interest in air quality as a result of this, as people began to read more about the connections that we make between the science that we're doing and how we're engaged in taking measurements. This is some data from ARL. It's a flight track of looking at CO2 um, and some sampling flights that they made earlier this spring. And I want to link this into the fact that the pandemic presents so many challenges. However, it also presents opportunities, particularly for those of us who are interested in making uh, observations, uh, whether you're in a rural area or an urban area. And the data are just now appearing in peer reviewed literature that talk about the dramatic decreases in some of our air quality parameters that we're measuring, whether it's ozone or PM or CO2, and the changes that occurred when you had non essential businesses that shuttered, when you had individuals that started to work from home on a regular basis, and traffic patterns in many cities became uh, almost zero overnight. So do we as a scientific community and you know, have the right types of measurements in place to study the arc of the global COVID-19 pandemic and those effects ultimately on the air that we breathe? And so while I hope my remarks this morning haven't been too heavy on the doom and gloom side, I do want to put our changing environment in a perspective when it comes to economic measures in the US. So here's a graphic from NOAA showing just in 2020 thus far, the 16 weather and climate disasters uh, that we've had that have exceeded a billion dollars each, 16, and we're only in October. These events have included one drought, 11 severe storms, three tropical cyclone events, and a wildfire event. 
and they've resulted, unfortunately, in the loss of life of 188 people, and they've had significant economic impacts on these communities and neighbors that live here. 2020 has become the sixth consecutive year where we've had 10 or more billion with a B dollar weather or climate disasters in the United States. And then over the last 41 years, the years with 10 or more separate of these events have been 98, 2008, 2011, 2012, and then every year since 2015. So when we talk about the value of investing in observations and investing in infrastructure and atmospheric research as a whole, whether that's data or models, it cannot be overstated when you look at the present terms of the realities of these weather and climate disasters. And I mentioned I talk a little bit about changing tools. So when we transition to other changes beyond the environmental ones, specifically, I want to mention tools and technologies. So uncrewed or as formally said, unmanned aircraft systems are still relatively new to atmospheric research, but it's something that uh, Air Resources Laboratory and the Atmospheric Turbulence and Diffusion Division in Oak Ridge have been investing in heavily. Uh, we have a robust UAS program where we're gathering measurements of air temperature and humidity, uh, wind pressure, wind speed, and we're also exploring opportunities to make air quality and chemistry measurements, looking at trace gases and aerosols from these platforms. And while these platforms have been flown particularly for a lot of oceanic work and coastal work, I think some of the realms of possibilities for atmospheric measurements using these types of drones or UAS are really on the cusp of where some of our cutting edge science is. And I'll speak a little bit more about that when I talk about some of the work that we're doing at, in ARL and at ATDD. And of course, even though I'm not a modeler, I do have to say I absolutely value uh, the work of the models as tools so that we can take those measurements and observations and be able to extend them out on temporal and spatial scales, understanding regional and national and global change, understanding subseasonal to seasonal forecast. Uh, and these systems really provide us with information and, and uh, new knowledge that we can use. And so the Uni uh, Unified Forecast System, UFS, is just one of those uh, priority activities within NOAA right now where they're engaging with the broader academic community as well as uh, state and local folks to try to understand uh, where we need to make improvements. And so we do have folks who are in ATDD that are engaged in some of this UFS work as well. And virtual collaboration. I think I'd be remiss if I failed uh, to acknowledge the fact that this is the first totally online NADP fall meeting and scientific symposium. And the uh, nimbleness of the committee to be able to make this change and pivot from what has traditionally been an in-person engagement to an online engagement. You know, I don't think I can uh, speak for everyone, but I'd say many of us have probably Zoomed and go to meeting and go to webinar and Google meeted ourselves over the past few months. Uh, however, being able to provide synchronous and asynchronous collaboration opportunities and communication venues virtually allows us to expand our networks. Uh, you know, the roll call of individuals from around the world that are participating in these meetings this week is absolutely phenomenal. And so to talk about how, what that means for our science what that means for creating new collaborations, potentially with folks that we may not have even considered uh, before. Which brings me to my next slide about our changing community. So in recent conversations that I've had with colleagues from both academia as well as federal government, we've been discussing you know, this term of blank science. And I've had that blank in the title purposely because these terms here, the four terms on this slide, uh, disciplinary, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary, seem to be somewhat interchangeable in some of our communications uh, when you look across the board. But it's clear to me that in various disciplines or in various countries, 
the meanings behind these different terms can vary somewhat. And so as we think about bringing people alongside of us in order to have these multi inter and transdisciplinary research activities, I want us to be able to think more about this terminology and what this means for atmospheric research. Uh, I also think we need to also think not only about the science and how it's involved evolving in this way, but also about the funding for the science. Uh, so much of the funding seems to be focused on certain disciplinary areas. Uh, you know, how do we rethink those stovepipes so that we can truly support research and long term observations that address some of these multi inter and transdisciplinary scientific challenges that we all face. And of course, change in community, social sciences. And I've seen this bubble up through my career where the geosciences and environmental sciences have uh, really started to embrace understanding the sociological aspects of the work we do and not just looking at the physical and biological pieces. And so as we grow that relationship between atmospheric research and social sciences, I think back to how AMS uh, several years ago started to formally recognize the fact that there are gains to the research that can be made when we start thinking about the clear and compelling need that we have to include social sciences so that we can understand how individuals and society are using the data that we collect. How are they putting that into their own knowledge banks so they can inform their own decisions? Uh, and then we also need to think about dissemination of that information and how we're sharing information in ways that are actually useful for the decision makers and the stakeholders in our various communities so that they can be prepared or mitigate for the various environmental challenges and changes that are ahead. And then inclusion and equity. I think when we talk about the changing atmospheric research community, we'd be remiss if we didn't address inclusion and equity, particularly at the point, not only in the US, but in several countries around the world where we've had some civic and social unrest in 2020. When we look at the fact of we've had just decades and decades of underrepresentation of women and African Americans and indigenous peoples and Latinos and Latinas in our field, uh, we have to be able to confront that. And how do we address that in a systematic way so that all of these voices from these different communities and groups can be a part of moving atmospheric sciences forward. So I know that there are long-term advocates who have been working in these areas to address some of the concerns over years, and we thank them for their leadership. But I think what we see now is that organizations and individuals are moving from discussing a lot of these problems to actually addressing how do we move the needle on some of these inclusion and equity concerns. So knowledge is power. Now that we know we have this, we recognize this, how do we move so we have representative voices at the table as we are developing plans? One thing that I share with colleagues who are considering how they move and how they work within this space of our research is we need to move beyond monitoring uh, or mentoring rather, move beyond mentoring that summer intern and move to actually hiring and promoting and honoring individuals who are doing absolutely groundbreaking work in our field, but who may have characteristics that differ from our own. So in terms of NADP, you know, understanding the spatial and temporal trends can help our scientific community address changes in the environment, changes in tools and technology, changes in community. And that overall makes our science stronger. And that's the case for looking at the opportunities that come from changing environments, difficult situations, pandemic, wildfires, hurricanes, uh, civic unrest, new tools and technologies. How do we bring all of those opportunities to bear so that we can advance the science, not only now, but five, 10, 20, and 50 years into the future? 
So in thinking about all of those terms, I want to bring it down to the local level with some of the work we're doing and share with you some of our activities, scientific activities that we've been conducting, as well as some of the considerations that we've had uh, 2020 um, and in other years about how we make science work in a changing world. Our acting director of the Air Resources Laboratory is Ariel Stein, and many of you are familiar with us. So you know that we have four divisions in College Park, Maryland, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, Idaho Falls, Idaho, and Las Vegas, Nevada. For those that have a keen eye, you'll also note that all of those locations are located in areas where there is a US Department of Energy presence, which goes back to the historic nature of our divisions. This is a photo of my building that we work in in Oak Ridge. It's uh, 1948 is the genesis of the group that was here. So we predate even the official beginnings of NOAA as an agency. Started as a US Weather Bureau research station, looking at turbulence and diffusion of materials. And now in 2020, uh, we've aligned to looking at continuing our studies of the boundary layer, understanding climate observations and analyses, air chemistry, and of course, boundary layer processes. One of our major programs is the US Climate Reference Network. Many of you may be familiar with CRN. It's a long-term reference network of observations of air temperature and precipitation, soil moisture, and soil temperature that are collected currently at 139 sites. All of the installation, maintenance, and operations of these 139 sites is handled by staff out of that small white building that I just showed you, ATDD and Oak Ridge. Uh, we do this in collaboration with some folks from uh, NOAA's uh, NCEI. As you may imagine, maintaining continuous operations has been challenging in a good year, but it's been even more difficult with the pandemic halting travel. So our team has had to be very creative in how we continue to approach maintenance, given that they cannot physically travel to provide maintenance at these sites. So we rely even more now on our site host, uh, those individuals, like those that were honored by Greg and his slide on awards. We have individuals we work at at many of these sites who have stepped up to the plate for us in order to help us troubleshoot and maintain several of our sites in CRN given that our staff are unable to travel. These are just a few of the instrumentation um, types of sensors that we're using in CRN, uh, looking at uh, soil moisture and temperature. One unique feature of CRN is we, have do trip, we do have triple redundancy when it comes to some of these measurements. Uh, and on the next four slides, I'll just show you an example of some of the sites that we have, particularly those that are really picturesque. So here's our site at Grand Teton National Park in Wyoming. Again, uh, as, as with some of the NADP sites, it's just a beautiful background uh, and a lovely place to work. And then we have places like Mule Shoe, Texas, which most of us have probably never visited, but just a lovely grassland site. And while our team was out providing maintenance at the site, beautiful rainbow appeared. So just being able to be out in the environment and have experiences like this. And then Utiavik, formerly known as Barrow, Alaska, presents some interesting working conditions when you're trying to get out and maintain sites as well in CRN. Denali National Park and Preserve. Uh, and one thing that we you know, think about when we come to our work in Alaska and expanding CRN's footprint in Alaska. We currently have 23 sites installed, but our long-term goal is to have even 29 or 30 sites. And I like to show this photo of Ruby, Alaska, because when I talk about creativity when it comes to atmospheric research, the engineers who work with CRN have to be creative because you're accessing sites like this one at Ruby uh, and installing scientific equipment in a really remote location. It's not for the faint of heart. So you're relying on things like float planes and spray canisters of bear deterrent and mosquito suits. They are part and parcel 
of the work that these engineers and technicians do in order to help us collect this all important data for this network. And then CRN also is branching out into other areas and it's used by some of our scientists in order to develop four kilometer daily updating gridded soil moisture products over the CONUS. And so they're using CRN soil and vegetation property data from some of our sites in order to develop these gridded data sets. Uh, and then PRISM is used to, is compared to the CRN data. And as you see here, some of the individual events were captured well. However, over the long term, there was really no overall divergence. And we've got scientists who are still working to incorporate that CRN data and, and look at these different activities as well. So when it comes to surface energy budget and thinking about the boundary layer, we have a long history of doing this type of work uh, in our office in Oak Ridge and looking at what happens with the energy budget from the bedrock into the boundary layer and trying to understand the physical and chemical processes uh, so that we can improve our subseasonal to seasonal forecast. And that all happens in our surface energy budget network or SBEN program, SEBN program, where we're monitoring climate and we're also looking at uh, surface atmosphere exchange of water and energy and carbon and how that relates to land surfaces and ecosystems. And so this is a wonderful picture of the tower. It's a 60 meter tower that we operate at Chestnut Ridge, which is not far from our office in East Tennessee. And you'll see we have it instrumented with sensors at various heights on this tower throughout the canopy so that we can have a better understanding of some of the variability that happens, not only within the canopy, but exchange between the canopy and the atmosphere just above. And I mentioned drones and UAS work. These are photos of some of our small fleet of uncrewed aircraft systems that we have. You'll see our team out here launching and conducting uh, work on some of these systems. We're using them to measure meteorological variables and atmospheric constituents. We have participated in several large field studies in order to use these drones to make measurements and this is just an example of some of the fleet that we have. In the past five years, our team has completed over 520 flights. Uh, if, you, if you'll look here, especially at the payload capacity, we do uh, use this payload capacity to determine the types and the amount of sensors that we can carry on each of these individual uh, platforms for our various measurement studies. And perhaps I can get this this little short video to load. It might not. Ah, it won't load. Ah, it might. And so this short video that I'm hoping will play for you guys is just nine seconds long and it shows uh, just how we launch some of these fixed wing aircraft. Uh, the rotary aircraft, of course, can take off and land almost on a dime, but the fixed wing have this launching mechanism that we use in order to launch these. And I don't know if it's gonna play. So I'm gonna go on to the next slide. There we go. So this is just a sample of some of the data that we collect using those UAS measurements. So we're looking at you know, sensible heat fluxes, evolution of air temperature and water vapor in the environment and then some of the publications that our scientists have been contributing to. One that's been fairly interesting for me given my background is, is using these platforms to understand, to understand spatial representativeness of point measurements as well. And then of course air quality modeling partnerships. I mentioned I'm not a modeler but I do appreciate all of the work that they do and how invested they are in upgrading and maintaining uh, some of the weather and the air quality models that we use it within the community. And ARL has a great partnership with the National Weather Service for NAQFC, which is the National Air Quality Forecasting Capability. We have a team of scientists who are very dedicated to this work in providing 48 hour uh, forecast of PM and ground level ozone. And you'll see some of the results of their work here. And then 
you know, in closing, in the next few slides, I talk about you know, my research expertise, the work that I've been personally invested in since I started my career at NOAA and met some of you very early on in my graduate career working on atmospheric deposition and trying to understand some of the mechanisms and the processes that happen in various locations across the country, particularly when it comes to nitrogen exchange. Uh, we have Walker Branch Watershed, which has been continuously operating site, first as Aramon, currently as NTN. Uh, and we, this site dates back to some of the early work that our lab was involved in with wet and dry deposition uh, and some through fall studies. Uh, you know, this is a great site for us and we've, been, we've partnered with uh, NADP in order to collect some very interesting data about nutrient imbalances at this site over the years, and we're very happy to continue to operate Walker Branch Watershed or TN00. So as I mentioned, my interest has been really in nitrogen, specifically in ammonia. And I know that there are some uh, meetings yesterday and some very interesting talks later on today that are going to address atmospheric ammonia. What really drew me to this type of work was the fact that ammonia is such a challenge. When you talk about changeability, you know, ammonia should be right there. You talk about changing in abundance, the fact that it's bi-directional can be deposited as well as emitted, the fact that it's so reactive with so many other different chemical compounds. When it comes to measuring ammonia, it has always, always been a challenge. But I think it's one of those at the intersection of atmospheric research and biospheric research that really drives our understanding of some of the complex processes that happen between the atmosphere and vegetation and soils. One of the earlier studies that we conducted in collaboration with NADP, as well as with the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign was a site that we had set up to try to understand emissions from fertilized fields. Uh, it was a cornfield in this case, we set up instrumentation. We had a wonderful team of not only NOAA and Oak Ridge Associated University staff, but as well as some summer interns um, and postdocs who were engaged in helping us try to understand ammonia emission from fertilizer application and the input into air quality models. And, and this is just a snapshot of some of the data that we collected with a flux gradient system co-located with a relaxed eddy accumulation system. And then some of the modeling work that we used with the SURF ATM model in order to understand the flux that was simulated uh, from that model. And then the effects of an inhibitor that was inherent into the fertilizer and how that affected the amount of ammonia that was volatilized from the fertilized field. So while I've done quite a bit of work in looking at agricultural ecosystems, uh, as well as grassland ecosystems over my time with NOAA, one of the things that's always intrigued me has been coastal ecosystems and trying to understand and apply what we've learned in relatively flat homogeneous environments to something that's very complex. And again, I like ammonia because it's a difficult challenge. If you take ammonia, and you couple it with a coastal wetland, you've just got difficulty multiplied by 10 or 20 or 100. But it makes such an interesting challenge because so much of the drivers, when we start looking at um, bio bio, uh, biogeochemistry and cycling, happen at the margins in these coastal areas where you're transitioning from land to ocean and being able to understand the variability of chemical constituents like ammonia in these areas is so critical. This is just a photo of a study we did in collaboration with the NOAA National Estuarine Research Reserves and University of Delaware uh, in NADP, where we had a um, some ammonia monitoring going on, with the RIA system, the flux system, and then we also had some passive samplers that we deployed. And the chart here just shows just how much the variation was and that occurred in the ammonia concentration over time, uh, as well as passive samplers uh, plotted on top of that. And so this, this intersectionality of research is really where I see a lot of this work going. It is very challenging, not only from a scientific perspective, but an engineering perspective as well, uh, in trying to build equipment and sensors that can operate in highly humid, very warm temperatures and still give us accurate measurements as well. 
And so as we move into 2020 and beyond, particularly with the research that I'll be conducting, you know, this is the area where we're looking to work. And we hope to have some measurements if travel is allowed again and, and we're all in a better place in 2021, uh, some additional coastal wetland measurements for some of the nitrogen species as well. And so to kind of bring this all back around, when we talk about changing environment, changing tools and technology and changing community, to me, the bedrock of that is you have to have observations. We need short and long-term observations. We need observations in rural areas, suburban areas, urban areas. We need observations of not only meteorology, but also atmospheric chemistry, soil parameters. We need to bring to bear on some of these challenges and problems just a full suite of observations. And while I know funding is always a challenge when it comes to having you know, very well instrumented sites, I think if we start thinking about that multi and trans and interdisciplinary research, we'll be able to perhaps make some forward motion in that arena, as well as model development. The models are changing so rapidly. When you think about FV3 and UFS and just some of the advances that are happening, uh, it, it's really amazing from where we were 10 or 20 years ago. And then automation and virtual connections. We have an opportunity to use tools, communication tools, in order to find some solutions to some of our problems. Maybe to reach out to new collaborators and expand our network so that we can have uh, more interdisciplinary uh, teams to address some of these major environmental challenges that we're facing. And of course, partner engagement and collaboration is always key if we're going to move forward with a lot of this work. So I will end my slides there. Here's my email address if folks have questions or want to have continued communication about any of the ideas that I presented today or for some of the research that I talked about in the latter half of my presentation, I can connect you with the scientists who and engineers who are engaged in that work. So I thank you for your time and uh, Greg, I'll turn it over to you. Wow, well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Miles. This is a really incredible talk. I, I, I know that uh, we're recording everything on, on this, um, uh, for this symposium and, uh, you know, we're gonna talk to you about getting your permission to be able to post this and and uh, and use this, not, not only um, just for this symposium, but We've also posted uh, some of our um, keynote speakers on the NADP website, and uh, this is a fantastic talk. and And thank you so much for putting it together. I uh, I, I don't want to uh, to uh, hog the questions here, but in the interest of time, I think I'll just ask uh, one question. Um, so um, you, the 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 overriding theme that I got out of, of your talk is, is about working together and collaboration and how important that is. And, and you mentioned, um, you know, the funding situations that we all had to deal with for quite some time. And so what have been some of the more effective ways for you as, as a leader in your agency to collaborate with others? I mean, how, how do you get other agencies who are running parallel or you know, overlapping networks to, to, uh, to come to the table and say, all right, we're going to come out of our stovepipe and we're, we're going to work with you. Yeah, I, I will say it's tough, right? It's, it's such a, a large and kind of thorny issue, but I think there are a couple of different strategies. One is uh, what I have found really interesting is when you reach out to other agencies and other organizations, sometimes they're working on a very limited set of information about your network or about the observations that you're collecting. And sometimes that first engagement of just being a knowledge sharing engagement, here's where we are, here's our history. Um, because a lot of times I think, I, I, me as well, we, we hear the names of the networks, but we don't understand the history and the importance of these networks to really some foundational scientific work in particularly in atmospheric research. When I think about deposition work, I mean, some of the, the large names of folks that have done just groundbreaking work in this field were associated with NADP. And so I think being able to tell that story in a really cohesive way is a good first step. 
I also think we have to recognize the partnerships uh, because dollars are dwindling and, and funding is very tough to come by. Sometimes it's easier for us if we can partner to go to the funding agency to say, we're willing to work together on this and uh, we have a path forward where neither organization is to the detriment. Actually, we're doing a greater benefit to the overall science by combining our efforts here. Uh, and then finally, I think one of the things is patience. <laughs> I hate to say that given that, but just with what I've seen with previously and then as well as in 2020, uh, there's just a lot of hesitancy right now to fund new things because of the uncertainty of, of everything, of travel, of uh, honestly viability of some people's uh, programs. And so I think now is the time for us as a collective community to be able to develop our plans and our communication strategies so that when we get through this period of pandemic, we'll be better positioned to be able to go after those funding opportunities. Boy, well said, thank you so much. Uh, I re again, really appreciate you being here and, and uh, taking the time uh, to be with us and, and, and uh, uh, your presentation was fantastic. And we'll be, we'll be in touch with you about um, posting that so that others can, can see it uh, for a long time. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I Thank look you, forward Dr. to Thank you, Dr. Miles.